I'm Pat Cruz, director of the International Quilt Study Center and Museum, and one of the curators for the exhibition, American Quilts in the Modern Age. That exhibition uses quilts as a lens on society during a period of tumultuous change in America. The quilts and their makers provide fascinating insights into American reactions to those rapid changes. I want to introduce you to some of the makers whose lives add richness to the stories that their quilts tell. Their stories inspire, sometimes amuse, and always offer new insights into the times in which they lived. During the period between the Civil War and World War II, rapid technological advances forced American society to quickly adapt to industrial life. Certainly technological progress led to improvements in some people's lives, creating more evenly distributed wealth and leisure time. Yet, industrialization's detrimental side effects, child labor, monopolies, workers' riots, and polluted waterways were increasingly evident. In addition, Massive immigration and urbanization produced a sense of displacement and unease. Americans responded in different ways to these unsettling times. Some felt nostalgia for a simpler pre-industrial time, the colonial days. Others, disenchanted with modern life, found inspiration in exotic Asian and Middle Eastern cultures, cultures they were beginning to learn more about through travel and the recent opening of, tr of Japan to trade with the West. Quilt making reflected both the adoption of modern technology and the anti-modern tensions of American culture. Before the Civil War, quilt making was largely practiced by wealthy women who could afford to buy fabric specifically for quilts. After the Civil War, fabric and sewing machines became more plentiful and affordable, transforming quilt making into a democratic pastime performed by women from all economic backgrounds. In addition to this increased availability of fabric and sewing machines, other developments contributed to the expansion of quilt making. Women's magazines, for example, greatly increased their circulations during the last quarter of the 19th century. Savvy businessmen and magazine publishers perceived a market for quilt making aids and began offering patterns, templates, and eventually kits. There seemed to be an insatiable audience for these items. And this unique combination of changes and technological developments fueled the expansion of quilt making in America between 1870 and 1940. Anna Hazel Burmeister is the first quilt maker I'd like to introduce. Anna's parents were among the 150,000 people who immigrated to the United States from Germany during the 19th century. They were seeking social freedoms and hoping to pursue land and economic opportunities available in the United States. Anna was born on the family farm in rural Wisconsin. She became a dressmaker after finishing two years of high school. During this time, she made this pineapple quilt and entered it in the 1894 Wisconsin State Fair. She won first place in the log cabin division, receiving a premium of $4. By December 1905, she had moved to Chicago and was working in the dressmaking section of Marshall Fields Department Store. While there, she decided to pursue a career in dentistry. She moved to Milwaukee to attend dental school at Marquette University and graduated in 1912 as one of the first female dentists in the United States. This Milwaukee Journal article quotes her as saying, it's been hard work. The money didn't come easy and my course took a lot, but I did no more than other girls have done and can do. All that's required is the determination. Anna Burmeister practiced dentistry in Milwaukee until her retirement in 1954 at age 79. 
She was a founding member of the Federation of American Women Dentists, now the American Association of Women Dentists. Like most professional women of her era, she never married. Alice made her quilt at the height of what was called the calico craze in America. It was a celebration of America's domestically produced fabrics and an effort by patriotic Americans to shun imported fabrics and proudly wear only domestically produced textiles. After the Civil War scarcities, the inexpensive cottons printed in the New England mills became the staple for pieced quilts, and calico became popular for clothing worn to social events. For example, in 1877, the Young Men's Social Club of Lawrence, Kansas, sent invitations to the, quote, first calico ball of the season, printed on swatches of calico. Another group, the German immigrants in Atchison, Kansas, organized a calico necktie party in 1887. It was a matchmaking event where, quote, the ladies wore calico dresses, each depositing with the doorkeeper a tie made out of the same material as their dress. This was drawn by one of the gentlemen, and the two were united for the evening. Cotton was not only fashionable, but affordable as prices dropped dramatically from Civil War highs of 10 to $20 per yard to less than 10 cents a yard. Alice was only 14 years old when she inscribed her name on this quilt in 1873. Her quilt served as a scrapbook documenting the decade stylish prints for quilts and clothing. According to family tradition, Mary Ann Stoner made this quilt for her second daughter in honor of her marriage in 1884. Since the date 1887 is quilted into the center hexagon of the quilt, Apparently, it took Mary several years after her daughter's marriage to finish the quilt. Not that unusual, is it? Mary Ann was born in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. When she was four years old, her parents loaded up their belongings in a covered wagon and moved to Ohio. In December 1860, just before the Civil War broke out, she married a local carpenter, Jacob Stoner whose parents also had migrated from Pennsylvania. They had three daughters. Her quilt is made from relatively large hexagons, about three inches across. Most of the hexagons are cut from a different cotton print. Strategically placed in one corner is a piece of fabric printed with the date 1776. It was a souvenir of the nation's centennial celebration of 1876, no doubt. Mary's mosaic patchwork quilt is an example of a patchwork format that existed alongside the more popular repeating block style patterns that dominated American quilt making during this period. You see, immigrants from the British Isles brought the mosaic patchwork technique to the American colonies hexagons and diamonds were the most frequently used geometric shapes. Mary Hernandred Ricard made this crazy quilt over a long period of time. She clearly understood this was a major achievement, that it would be her masterpiece. Marked on the quilt is her signature, her title for the piece, My Crazy Dream, and the words Boston, 1877 to Haverhill, 1912, and her self-portrait. She had a photograph of herself transferred onto a piece of silk and then used it as a patch in the quilt. According to census records, the Ricard family was not wealthy. Mary's husband was, at various times, a blacksmith, a machinist, and a salesman of house furnishing goods. Mary was a landlady and a milliner. Her quilt is testimony to the fact that middle-class families could aspire to luxurious-looking goods, including velvets and plushes, as well as silk satins and brocades.
Like many American women, Mary was swept up by a seeming mania for crazy quilts during the last two decades of the 19th century. They were referred to even in their own times as, quote, bewildering and kaleidoscopic. When crazy quilt mania first took hold, the crazy look was seen as the epitome of urbane, sophisticated taste. Asymmetrical, irregular geometric patterns were associated with the Japanese style, which had taken the public by storm at the 1876 Centennial Exposition in, G in Philadelphia, where the Japanese pavilion was one of the most popular displays at the fair. In fact, more than 10 million people attended that fair. These crazy quilts seemed fresh, free of old constraints and rules, and modern. In contrast, older quilts with repeating block patterns were regarded as old-fashioned by urban women like Mary. Mary, like many women of her day, chose to construct a crazy quilt that evoked a happy, dreamy place, an enchanted fairyland, a fairyland that existed far away, apart from any painful realities or practicalities of modern life. She included fans, butterflies, spiders, and peacocks, as well as a patch with Earl King, a mischievous European folk figure whose name translated into English is Elf King. He's shown here stealing a child. The exuberant feel-good quality of these quilts, their opulent color, texture, and pattern, and their surprising juxtapositions make them a unique and fascinating genre of American quilts. Mary Robinson Olds and her husband Samuel Olds were both born in Vermont, where they married in the mid-1840s. They moved to Indiana in the mid-1850s, where they farmed for a few years. Then Samuel turned to business pursuits and became a prosperous dry goods merchant. Mary and Samuel had 10 children, and Mary is believed to have made this quilt as a wedding gift for her youngest son. She made it at a time when Americans were looking for something totally new for their homes. They wanted a change from the eclectic, cluttered Victorian style. Instead of looking for something totally new, however, Many Americans turned to furnishings and architecture based on the past, the colonial era, and the colonial revival style was born. It took off in the 1890s and dominated the decorative arts and architecture through the 1920s and 30s. The colonial revival started in an era of nationalism and patriotism following the nation's centennial celebration and it grew stronger as a reaction to changes wrought by industrialization, urbanization, and immigration. It was a romanticized interpretation of the past. Quilts which the Victorians had derided as old-fashioned were now described in women's magazines as a necessity for the well-furnished home. Furthermore, advertisements advised women that if they had not inherited a quilt from grandmother, they should make one. Mary clearly embraced the colonial revival ideal for bed coverings. The stars on her quilt that she made for her son and new daughter-in-law are fashioned from indigo blue fabric with tiny white polka dots. Ladies Home Journal informed readers in 1896 that, quote, Nowadays, the patchwork quilt is most often made from materials specially bought for the purpose and usually one color and white are used. The editors also recommended that quilters use turkey red or indigo blue because those colors were particularly effective and more importantly, were wash fast. Harper's Bazaar in 1905 recommended blue and white patchwork quilts or homespun woven coverlets for colonial revival bedrooms. Mary would have been familiar with early feathered star quilts with their fine quilting done in wreaths and vines, which were especially popular at the time she was married in the 1840s. When her children were grown, she pieced this intricate pattern and set it off with superb quilting 
at 9 to 10 stitches per inch. Her striking quilt passed down as an heirloom in her son's family for several generations. This is another outstanding colonial revival quilt. It's believed to have been made by Addie Woodhouse around age 67 for her daughter Eulalie. It appears to have been made just after Eulalie was widowed. According to the family, Eulalie was not a quilter, but Addie was. Therefore, this quilt is attributed to Addie. This serves as a reminder that we must be cautious in assuming that a name on a quilt is the name of the maker. The choice of the Burgoyne surrounded pattern was meaningful to a New York family. The title commemorated the surrender of General Burgoyne of the British Army to the American forces in 1777, following the Battle of Saratoga. The large American force surrounded Burgoyne's troops, and this decisive victory was a turning point of the American Revolution. The Burgoyne surrounded design interprets historic weaving patterns found on early 19th century woven coverlets. Numerous such coverlets were woven in northern New York. Like quilts, these coverlets were considered highly desirable for the colonial revival bedroom. Now this diamond mosaic quilt is attributed to Cordelia and Hannah Malla, whose names are prominently featured on the top of this quilt. Hannah's great-grandfather was a German immigrant. He immigrated to Augusta County, Virginia, where Hannah was born in 1816. She later moved to Indiana with her parents. In 1836, she married William Harrison Mallow, whose ancestors also immigrated from Germany to Virginia and then on to Indiana. Hannah and William had four children. Lucinda was their oldest daughter. It's tempting to assume that the number 76 refers to the date 1876. However, the fabrics in the quilt include some that date from the 1880s or later. The number instead is believed to refer to Hannah's age at the time of her death. Perhaps Cordelia completed it after her mother's death in 1892. Although impossible to know, it seems clear that Cordelia wanted to honor both herself and her mother with this quilt, something quilt makers often did, though not with such prominent letters as this one. Cora Eccles, maker of this quilt, taught school for three years after she graduated from high school. As expected of women of her generation, she quit teaching when she married Marvin Densmore. The young couple lived next door to his parents. Marvin's mother was a quilt maker, and so was Cora's mother. Consequently, Cora had experienced quilt makers to turn to for advice and help. Both Cora and her mother were active members of the DAR, Daughters of the American Revolution, so it's not surprising that a colonial revival quilt would be her choice. This coxcomb and berries quilt was the perfect choice for a colonial revival quilt made in southeastern Pennsylvania, for it had been the heart of a region where red and green applique quilts had flourished in the 19th century. Undoubtedly, Cora, like others in the area, had seen numerous antique red and green applique quilts made by their grandmothers and great-grandmothers, and so it would have been easy to find a quilt of this design to copy or adapt as they came back in style. The design is typical Pennsylvania German work. Cora may also have been influenced in her choice by colonial revival tastemakers who argued in women's magazines that applique quilts were, quote, the most magnificent specimens of patchwork which have been handed down for generations. Another maker, Josephine Ripper Justice, born in Seymour, Iowa, married Charles Justice on July 4, 1900. They lived their married life in Trenton, Missouri. She and her husband, a railroad engineer, had only one child, a son, Ernest, and according to her grandson, she was a prolific quilt maker. 
Josephine made this horn of plenty applique quilt sometime during the 1920s. She chose her pattern from the thousands of new patterns that flooded the market during this decade when American women seemed to have a nearly insatiable desire for new quilt patterns. Many different respires responded to this demand. Patterns were offered by mail order companies, by newspapers, and by women's magazines like the Modern Priscilla, where this pattern first appeared in 1919. The editors suggested a color scheme of red with orange centers for the flowers. Josephine obviously chose a different color scheme using purple and pink fabrics in the lighter, brighter color palette more popular by the mid-1920s. Christine Sorensen of Rockville, Nebraska made her version of the very popular Lone Star quilt pattern sometime between 1928 and 1930 when her three young children aged, ranged in age from two to eight years. According to her daughter, she traveled to Grand Island to purchase the fabric at the J.C. Penney store. Her favorite clerk helped her match some leftover print scraps from matching dresses she had made for her daughters and herself. Christine liked bright colors and the Nile green, canary yellow, and dark orange solids they selected coordinated perfectly with her leftover prints. She pieced the diamond shapes of the star on her treadle sewing machine. When she completed the top, members of the Ladies' Aid of the community church did the quilting in the family's living room. She proudly used her Lone Star quilt as a bedspread in the guest room. Christine's bright, cheerful, well-cared-for quilt serves as a reminder that the urge to participate in the colonial revival permeated most households in the United States by the time of the Great Depression. Thrifty, hard-working women took the time to make the stylish quilts that tastemakers declared were most suitable for special bedrooms. Another maker of this period who proudly traced her ancestry back to a Revolutionary War soldier was Olive Cook, who was born in Union County, Illinois during the Civil War. She traced her ancestry for membership in the DAR back to John Hargrave, her great-great-grandfather on her mother's side. He served in the Revolutionary War as a private from South Carolina. Olive married Lewis Cook, a tailor and clothing store manager. Olive was herself a talented seamstress who enjoyed making fashionable clothing for her two daughters and herself. By the 1930s, when she made this quilt, fashion favored applique quilts with toned down color combinations, not the strong red and green combinations of 19th century applique quilts. In fact, pink replaced red as the favorite color in floral applique of the 1930s. Olive, however, chose a unique combination of bright red, pink, yellow, and orange in her floral motifs. The bright flowers are toned down by her use of an apple green color. She used this softer green instead of the darker greens more typical of the 19th century versions of floor block applique quilts that she was emulating. Near the top of her colonial revival quilt, she embroidered her name and the date. This quilt was made by Rose Pagers, the child of German immigrants who settled in Chicago shortly after the Civil War. There, Rose, her four sisters, and one brother were born. In 1900, Rose married Alexander Mojeska, a relatively recent Russian immigrant. Alexander and Rose had two children. Rose made this quilt during the mid-1930s after her children were grown. She used a pattern for her quilt, as did so many women of this era. It's a Nancy Cabot pattern called Rose Bower that was published in the Chicago Tribune on October 30, 1935. Patterns as well as complete kits for quilts were now widely available and heavily advertised in women's magazines and farm magazines like the modern Priscilla, Priscilla and Farm and Fireside, 
as well as in syndicated columns in newspapers like Nancy Cabot's column for the Chicago Tribune. Perhaps Rose was drawn to this particular pattern because of its name. She certainly took care with its construction, following the basic instructions precisely and then adding her own improvements. One design change, the use of a black sateen foundation instead of the suggested pastel green background, makes this quilt much more dramatic. This is a quilt believed to have been made from a kit of die-cut pieces. It was made by Louise Thonstad, who was born in Norway and immigrated with her family to the Dakota Territory. She lived most of her life in Deadwood, South Dakota, and made this Dresden plate quilt around 1935. The Dresden plate pattern was very popular during the Depression era, along with Lone Star, Grandmother's Flower Garden, and the Double Wedding Ring. In fact, it was included in nearly every catalog of kits. The fabrics in this quilt are a veritable sampler of Depression-era prints and provide the first clues that this quilt was made from a kit. There are no fabrics that appear to be of an older vintage, as one would expect to see if the fabrics were from a scrap bag. Furthermore, some of the fabrics are different colorways of the same print. Die-cut quilt pieces in kits were often cut from stacks of scraps left over from ready-to-wear garment construction. Although we could not identify the specific source of this kit, these clues suggested that her quilt was made from a kit. The last maker I'd like to introduce is Ida Stowe, who was born on a Missouri farm to a family of prolific quilt makers. Years later, after Ida married Henry Stowe and moved to Park Ridge, Illinois, she decided to enter the 1933 Sears Century of Progress Quilt Contest. If she won, she would receive the $200 bonus promised to a Progress-themed winner, in addition to the $1,000 grand prize, an almost unbelievable sum of money during the Great Depression. The response to the contest was overwhelming. There were more than 24,000 entries. When Ida delivered her quilt, she attached a typed explanation for the contest judges. Quote, there has been a request for a quilt of unusual or other than colonial design, which would depict and commemorate the century. Therefore, this quilt is submitted for your consideration. Her design was based on the Art Deco aesthetics of the 1930s rather than traditional formats, and the colors of her quilt Blue and gray were the official colors of the Century of Progress, and the image in the center is the official fair logo, the world and its progress around the sun. Unfortunately, the only prize Ida received was an honorable mention. Displeased with this result, Ida wrote a letter to the contest judges complaining that original designs in the Century of Progress theme were being overlooked. Apparently, 1933 was still too early for judges to favor unusual patterns over the time-honored traditional ones, even though the company had announced the $200 bonus prize to encourage original designs. In keeping with the contest theme, Ida quilted designs depicting 100 years of progress from sailboat to ocean liner, Conestoga, Conestoga wagon to automobile, and so forth. These close-ups give you some idea of the exceptional quilting designs that Ida and her mother executed for this unique contest quilt. Well, as you have seen, American quilt makers responded to the rapid modernization of the nation in a variety of ways. Some responded with an anti-modernist outlook, making crazy quilts with fairyland imagery in the escapist fashion of the Victorian era's aesthetic movement. Others became nostalgic and turned to a romanticized past, making traditional quilts like their grandmothers or great-grandmothers had made, 
and like the colonial revival tastemakers encouraged. Others embraced the century of progress and made quilts to celebrate the technological achievements of the era. These makers embody all the contradictions inherent in the process of becoming a modern nation. I hope you've enjoyed meeting some of the makers featured in the exhibition American Quilts in the Modern Age, 1870 to 1940, and learning more about how they dealt with rapid changes during this remarkable era. Thank you.